Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Uh, I would like to share uh, our experience uh, on the building of uh, resilient Philippine cities. Uh, ito pong ipipresent ako is based on uh, the experience of the NGO that I helped establish uh, in the aftermath of uh, Super Typhoon uh, Haiyan or Yolanda, uh, where we were fielded uh, to uh, to Eastern Visayas, uh, much of uh, the Visayas that were affected uh, by uh, Typhoon Yolanda, uh, more popularly known as the Yolanda Corridor. So ito pong mga isi-share ko is, is coming from that experience from uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, uh, 2013 uh, and going on for a number of years. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So let, let me just start with uh, just a, uh, uh, you know, what we, what, what we understand resilience to be. So it's the ability to plan, uh, prepare, absorb, recover from whatever adverse events uh, we, may, uh, we may experience. Next. Now, I'd, I'd like to apply the concept of resilience to cities. Uh, not only cities, uh, but cities in the sense uh, urban areas, actually, uh, because uh, we're becoming more and more urban. Um, so uh, city resilience is the capacity to, uh, to function uh, so that the people living there, working there, especially the poor and the vulnerable, are able to survive and thrive. Not, not just survive, but also thrive, no matter what kind of stresses or shocks they encounter. Okay, next. Now, why is this important? Well, as, as we know very well, the Philippines is rapidly urbanizing. Uh, we're now over 50% urban. Okay? We also know that because of climate change, uh, disasters are becoming more and more frequent and also much more distracted. And, you know, they kill, they injure, they affect thousands of people every year. Uh, they destroy homes, livelihoods, businesses, they displace a lot of people and they disrupt economic activities. Therefore, it is necessary to reverse the current kind of reactive approach uh, that many of our LGUs uh, still practice, uh, responding to them only after the effort and merely repairing or rebuilding what had been damaged before the disaster. Next, please. So what are the attributes of a resilient city? Based on the work of Rockefeller Foundation uh, under the 100 Resilient Cities Challenge, uh, the first uh, attribute is minimal human vulnerability. Uh, ito, ito pa lamang medyo challenge na sa atin, no? because it talks about people's access to basic needs. Okay, And, and as we know very well, uh, we are not... Uh, uh, many of our communities uh, still don't have uh, the complete uh, uh, delivery of, of basic needs. Next. Also, of course, uh, diverse livelihood and employment, access to finance. Uh, you know, again, this is another challenge because uh, many of our um, poor brothers and sisters don't have a culture of savings. Next. Uh, this number three, the adequate safeguards to human life and health, is uh, something that we experienced uh, very directly during the uh, lockdown, the, the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. You know, the access to health facilities and services and uh, emergency uh, services. Next. Now, this is something uh, collective identity and mutual support. This is something that we have seen in the case of the uh, uh, communities damaged by Yolanda, where uh, there were a lot of uh, communities that uh, the members of whom uh, helped each other uh, during the times of evacuation. Alam na nung mga tao kung saan sila pupunta, kanino mga bahay yung safe at kanino mga bahay yung hindi safe. Next. Of course, yung stability uh, among the members of the community and their feeling of security. Now, this is again something that uh, we saw uh, in, in the aftermath of Yolanda, where there was looting uh, in a number of establishments in Tacloban and in some other places there. Uh, and, and, the, and the difficulty of fielding uh, 
uh, emergency measures because of uh, certain uh, problems. Next. Now, this is another thing, the availability of financial resources and contingency funds. Uh, a lot of the uh, local governments that were affected by uh, Typhoon Yolanda, particularly the fourth to sixth class municipalities, uh, had a lot of difficulty uh, in, in, in rebuilding. Uh, they did not have sufficient uh, financial resources. They also did not have uh, uh, contingency funds. Next. Now, you know, because of the, uh, uh, I guess, the poverty and, and the uh, low levels of revenues of many of the uh, four to six class municipalities, they also experienced a lot of damage uh, because of their uh, exposure uh, to, to, the, to storm surges and flooding. And uh, so th this is something that uh, needs to be addressed, uh, particularly uh, uh, the appropriate kind of infra infrastructure. And uh, I, I, I particularly appreciate the presentation of Dr. Lasco about nature-based solutions. Next. Now, this continuity of critical services was very uh, glaring in the case of uh, the aftermath of Yolanda because uh, power was down, uh, the port, the airport were uh, non-functional. Uh, and uh, water supply was a problem. And, you know, so there was no contingency planning in place uh, at, at that particular time. Next. Now, there was also difficulty in communication and mobility with all the debris all over the place. It was so difficult to move around. Uh, Yolanda hit in November. Uh, we were on the ground in January. And we still could not go around uh, that, that effectively because of the uh, problems of mobility and the lack of communication. Next. Now, also, uh, there was a problem of uh, leadership uh, and management. Uh, it was not very clear who, who was you know, making the, 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 the decisions. And uh, there were a lot of uh, donor agencies that were coming and made you make a guluhan. Okay, so th this is something that I think is uh, an important consideration. Next. Of course, uh, empowering the stakeholders, educating people, and uh, providing uh, up-to-date information was very important. This also during Yolanda was not, uh, was not evident. Next. And integrated development planning. Uh, well, you know, Yolanda hit uh, several years back and uh, the, uh, the, the laws on DRRM and uh, climate change adaptation were kind of relatively new and uh, not very well known to many of the LGUs. And so this was uh, a kind of a problem uh, that was faced at that time. Next. So how do we apply these attributes to our uh, towns and cities? Next. Well, Briefly, it's actually adapting a, a development path that is disaster resilient, risk sensitive, ecosystem based, and correlated with poverty eradication. The last point here is, is important because of the social justice uh, objective that, that we are trying to achieve. Next. So what, what, what must we consider? Okay, number one are the external shocks the, the issue of poverty and the insecurity of livelihood. Uh, many of our poor households live in rural areas. Uh, they're very dependent on uh, agriculture, fisheries, forests, and livestock. Unfortunately, these this sources of livelihood are also the most affected by extreme weather events. And, and therefore, those who are dependent on them become even more vulnerable to disasters and impacts of climate change. Next, please. Another thing uh, that needs to be considered uh, are the natural resources and the environment. Now we know that we have rich na uh, natural resources, but we also have uh, de deforestation, degradation of watersheds, depletion of reefs and coral, uh, e uh, co coastal ecosystems. And this are reducing nature's defense capacity against uh, hazards. Now, th this practice, this degradation of our natural resources 
aggravates the impact of disasters such as floods, landslides, storm surges, typhoons, and drought. And you know, they, they contribute to overall ecosystem degradation and loss, including soil erosion, salin salinization of soils, and biodiversity loss. Next slide. Also, environmental degradation is reducing the availability of goods and services to local communities, many of whom depend on them. And so it shrinks the economic activities and the options for livelihood uh, of people. But also, you know, we know very well, and there have been a lot of uh, studies and uh, uh, policies that have been uh, adopted for this, is that healthy and diverse ecosystems are really more resilient to hazards. And there have been examples all over the country, for example, where there are, where there are mangrove forests, uh, the, the areas are less susceptible to storm surge and, and flooding. Next. Another thing we must consider, of course, is climate change and the disaster risks and the implications in food security. Uh, with, with climate change, we expect, to, uh, we expect more frequent and more intensive uh, climate-related hazards. Uh, also, the, the, the difficulty of predicting uh, and, and the change in the spatial distribution of, of the effects of, of climate change. Uh, data uh, is very important and, uh, and, uh, and science-based information and decision-making is very important here. Um, the, uh, as climate change uh, it, it will increase the risk and vulnerability of particular social groups and economic sectors uh, being the most uh, vulnerable, uh, the problems are compounded by climate change and, uh, you know, sea level rise, uh, ecosystem stress and the degradation of natural resources. Next. Also, uh, the increase in vulnerability uh, is much more significant in the poorer regions of the country, uh, particularly those uh, areas that are very dependent largely on subsistence agriculture. Uh, these are the regions that are most likely to be affected by food and water shortages. And we, we know where these places are. Uh, I, I think uh, this is being the target of a number of government policies in the last few years. Next. So what are the priority actions that we should take? Uh, one is to correlate and prioritize the eradication of poverty and hang hunger. This, I think, is, uh, should be uh, foremost when we talk about the building of resiliency in our towns and cities. Next. Adopting a risk-sensitive ecosystem-based uh, land use strategy, uh, which means the effective management of land, of water systems, forest, wetland, soils, other resources, so that we can redress the environmental causes of vulnerability and risks. Next. Protecting our livelihoods from shocks and making the country's food production system more resilient. As we had seen uh, in the case of uh, the Yolanda, many of the uh, areas, uh, sources of livelihood of people were damaged and uh, convincing people to turn into something more sustainable in terms of livelihood was not an easy thing because of the fact that they were so used to, to, to fisheries and agriculture, particularly coconut growing, that it was not that easy to convince them to adopt the change. Next. Uh, we, we need to invest more in disaster prevention, risk reduction, and mitigation. We, we find that especially in the poorer uh, LGUs, uh, four to six class municipalities, uh, there still is a very strong reactive kind of uh, post-disaster uh, relief and uh, rescue operation uh, focus. Uh, not much on prevention and, and risk reduction. Next. Uh, we have been trying to mainstream, uh, helping LGUs mainstream DRRM and climate change adaptation in, in local development plans. Uh, and we're trying to, to particularly get them to focus on adopting more productive and resilient livelihoods. As I said, it's 
easier said than done, uh, on more sustainable food production practices and technologies, and the effective management of natural resources uh, and the protection of the built environment. Uh, recently, we have been trying to promote the, uh, uh, the, the further improvements to their coastal, uh, coastal land use plans uh, in response to the proliferation of, uh, of uh, proposals for uh, coastal land reclamations. Next. Investing in planning tools. Uh, this is something that uh, a number of LGUs have started to do, but we don't find it uh, prevalent in the poorer LGUs, particularly, again, the fourth to sixth class municipalities. Uh, they don't even have enough personnel, permanent personnel, to manage their GIS uh, mapping uh, uh, functions. Very often, uh, the people they have are casuals, and uh, their contracts are renewed every uh, what three to six months. And and you know th th this is this is a, a big disadvantage uh, when you're trying to do risk mapping when you don't have the right kind of people to do the, the kind of work. But we know very well that this uh, GIS-based disaster risk mapping is, is very important and it needs to be combined with a scenario-based approach uh, to integrate disaster risk reduction and management and climate change adaptation in their land use plans. Next. And then formulating a comprehensive long-term local economic development plan. Um, the, the, the World Bank uh, has been uh, promoting this uh, program of uh, ready to rebuild. Uh, and it's been helping LGUs in coming up with post-disaster recovery plan. However, in my experience, in the experience of our NGO, we feel that the preparation of a long-term economic development plan should have a built-in post-disaster element in it. And it should be done before the disaster comes. So that when a disaster hits, all that's needed is you tweak it to the uh, particular uh, circumstances or characteristics of that particular uh, disaster and be able to immediately uh, implement your recovery uh, measures. Next. So in conclusion, Building the resilience of our cities and towns can be achieved by adapting a development path that's, that is disaster resilient, risk sensitive, ecosystem based, and correlated with poverty eradication. I think the two or earlier speakers, uh, uh, Ms. Eliazar and Dr. Lasco, also touched on this. Uh, and, and this is something based on our experience in the field of working uh, with uh, more than 40 LGUs in the Yolanda Corridor, we believe that this is really the way to go. That's it for my presentation. Thank you very much.